Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to express my personal thanks, as well as that of Cantor Mayor, and indeed uh, the appreciation of all of us at Temple Emanuel for your gracious hospitality here at Condon Street Baptist Church this afternoon. I have fond memories of being here quite a number of years ago when members of our two congregations joined together in a class to learn about each other's worship traditions and practices. We visited each other's sanctuaries to help each of us appreciate better what we were learning about each other's customs. So really, it's very nice to be back here. And I must say, it's been a delight for us at Emmanuel to work with and develop friendships with Reverend Dove and Reverend Hooks. In token of that friendship, I'd like to present to you, Reverend Dove, a book called Shared Dreams, Martin Luther King, Jr. and the Jewish Community. I grew up in a small country town in southeastern Texas, near Houston. At the time, the Civil Rights Movement was developing across the South. I graduated from high school in 1961. My school was not an integrated school. It didn't integrate until a year after I graduated. And then they only admitted one black student, very totally. I remember the mean-spirited attitudes of so many people in our town, which manifested itself in segregated swimming pools, water fountains, public restrooms, and so forth. People were committed to the attitudes and the way of life that they were familiar with. They didn't want to change. Most of them looked down on people of color. But I also remember that there were some courageous people I remember the courageous stance of some of the community's leaders who advocated and worked for the integration of our county's junior college, which was located in our town. <coughs> that was done several years before the town's schools were integrated. I was very proud that my parents attended meetings and supported the move toward opening the doors of learning to everyone in the community in that college. That was indeed a first step in creating a new way of life. It opened new horizons. I remember hearing Dr. King's messages during those years of my youth in Texas. I knew how dangerous it was for blacks, and I knew how easily intimidated many whites were in face of the discriminatory masses that surrounded them, just and by his actions. I knew that he offered hope for a better and more promising future, not just for blacks, but for everyone in our nation. I came up north for college and seminary, and I've lived in the north ever since. Well, in many ways, I found the north to be more congenial and accepting of differences among people of different races, religious denominations, and national origins. But even here, we don't live in a perfect world. In too many places, segregation persists, not by law, but in fact, in neighborhoods, in schools, and in jobs. I was distressed when I read this morning in the Providence Journal about how adults and teenagers are treating a Cranston teenager named Jessica Alquist who went to court to have a prayer banner removed from her school. You see, she is an atheist, and as such, objected to the introduction of sectarian prayer in the public school. Reading this about the hostility she's experienced reminded me of the racial bigotry that surrounded me when I was growing up in Texas. The issue is different, yes, but the hostility the unwillingness to try to understand a different point of view, and the refusal to accept a ruling of a court of law is the same, and it is deep in trouble. I suspect that Dr. King would have understood this young woman's struggle and her right to voice her opinion without having words and threats of hate directed at her. In his book, 
strength to love, Reverend Keating said, I will be the last to condemn the thousands of sincere and dedicated people outside the churches who have labored unselfishly through various humanitarian movements to cure the world of social evils. For I would rather a man be a committed humanist than an uncommitted Christian. In 1964, a year before I entered rabbinical school at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in New York, my seminary honored Dr. King with an honorary degree. Dr. King was a close personal friend and a close partner of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who became one of my teachers at the seminary. Both men studied and taught the messages of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. Both of them felt compelled to speak the truth to communities in the South and in the North. There's a famous picture of King and Heschel leading the marchers from Selma to Montgomery. I've always cherished that picture. These two men, speaking as modern-day prophets, addressed a nation that did not want to hear the impassioned calls for freedom, for human dignity, and civil rights for all citizens that they had to speak about. At a meeting of the Synagogue Council of America, Dr. King firmly articulated his belief in nonviolence. He said, the Hebrew prophets belong to all people because their concepts of justice and equality have become ideals for all races and civilizations. Today, we particularly need the Hebrew prophets because they taught that to love God was to love justice. That each human being has an inescapable obligation to denounce evil where he sees it and to defy a ruler who commands him to break the covenant. In March of 1968, when I was still in rabbinical school, the Professional Association of Conservative Rabbis, known as the Rabbinical Assembly, which I am now a member of, invited Dr. King to be a guest at its convention. My illustrious predecessor, Temple Manual, Rabbi Eli A. Bowman, who was the president of the assembly that year, welcomed Dr. King to the convention. Rabbi Bonin had been a liberator of the American army of some of the concentration camps at the end of World War II. In his capacity as president of the rabbinical assembly, he pointed out to his colleagues that if American Jews ignored the problems of black Americans, they would have no right to condemn any in Germany who went along with Hitler's program. We would have no right to blame the Pope Pius XII of those days, for remaining silent in the face of the extermination of the Jews. In response, the rabbis joined in welcoming their distinguished guests by singing, We Shall Overcome, in Hebrew. <laughs> then Professor Heschel introduced his friend. Praising him as an authentic prophet, he said, where in America do we hear a voice like the voice of the prophets of Israel? Martin Luther King is a sign that God has not forsaken the United States of America. God has sent him to us. His presence is the hope of America. In his address, King honored Heschel, acclaiming Heschel's speech at the 1963 Chicago Conference on Race and Religion where the two men met and became friends. He celebrated Heschel's participation in the Selma to Montgomery March and declared that he considered Heschel to be a truly great prophet. My friends, those were stirring days in America when Reverend King and Rabbi Heschel promoted love and justice for everyone. They saw their work begun, but their work is not finished. We who have learned from them, who have been inspired and uplifted by them, must join hands to move their work towards completion. We still have many barriers of discrimination to overcome, 
many obstacles to educational equality and economic prosperity to break down. The essence of their quest and ours must be to see all human beings as God's children. However we define and however we worship or not worship God. Our ancient rabbis asked why it was that God created only one single human being at the beginning of time. Their answer is a simple but very profound answer. They said, it was so that no one can say, my father, instead of in your father. <laughs> when all of us can celebrate our common humanity and joyfully accept each other as brothers and sisters, then we will be able, as Reverend Dove has already heard, as Dr. King so magnificently said in his famous I Have a Dream speech, then we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men and women, I must add to his words, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Sure.